Scrooge and Marley, Act One, by Israel Horovitz. Drama. Background. Charles Dickens' novel, A Christmas Carol, from which this play was adapted, shows sympathy for the struggles of the poor. Set in England during the 19th century, it was a time of rapid industrial growth. In this booming economy, the wealthy lived in luxury, but the poor and the working class suffered. About the playwright, as a teenager, Israel Horovitz, born 1939, did not like books by Charles Dickens. As he got older, however, he came to appreciate Dickens's style and stories. Today, Horovitz refers to Dickens as a masterful storyteller. He imagines that if Dickens were alive today, he would be our greatest television writer or perhaps screenwriter. As Horovitz adapted Dickens's novel into a play, he thought about which character was his favorite. Surprisingly, it is Scrooge who reminds Horovitz of his own father. A Christmas Carol, Scrooge and Marley, Act One, by Israel Horovitz. The place of the play, various locations in and around the city of London, including Scrooge's chambers and offices, the Cratchit home, Fred's home. Scrooge's school, Fezziwig's offices, Old Joe's hideaway. The time of the play. The entire action of the play takes place on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and the morning after Christmas, 1843. Act One, Scene One. Ghostly music in auditorium. A single spotlight on Jacob Marley downstage center. He is ancient, awful, dead-eyed. He speaks straight out to auditorium. My name is Jacob Marley, and I am dead. <laughs> oh no! There is no doubt that I am dead. The register of my burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and by my chief mourner. Ebenezer Scrooge. I am dead as a doornail. A spotlight fades up stage right on Scrooge in his counting house, counting. Lettering on the window behind Scrooge reads Scrooge and Marley Ltd. The spotlight is tight on Scrooge's head and shoulders. We shall not yet see into the offices and setting. Ghostly music continues under. Marley looks across at Scrooge pitifully. After a moment's pause, I present him to you, Ebenezer Scrooge, England's most tight-fisted hand at the grindstone. Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Secret and self-contained, and solitary as an oyster, the cold within him freezes his old features, nips his pointed nose, shrivels his cheek, stiffens his gait, makes his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and speaks out shrewdly in his grating voice. Look at him! Look at him! Scrooge counts and mumbles. Ten times four equals minus. They owe me money, and I will collect. I will have them jailed if I have to. They owe me money, and I will collect what is due me. Marley moves towards Scrooge two steps. The spotlight stays with him. Ah. <sighs> He and I were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was my sole executor, my sole administrator, my sole assign, my sole residuary legatee, my sole friend, and my sole mourner. But Scrooge was not so cut up by the sad event of my death, but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of my funeral. And solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. He never painted out my name from the window. There it stands on the window and above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to our business call him Scrooge, 
and sometimes they call him Marley. He answers to both names. It's all the same to him, and it's cheaper than painting in a new sign, isn't it? Pauses, moves closer to Scrooge. Nobody has ever stopped him in the street to say, with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children ever ask him what it is a clock. No man or woman, now or ever in his life, not once inquire the way to such and such a place. Marley stands next to Scrooge now. They share, so it seems, a spotlight. But what does Scrooge care of any of this? It is the very thing he likes. To edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. A ghostly bell rings in the distance. Marley moves away from Scrooge now, heading downstage again. As he does, he takes the light. Scrooge has disappeared into the black void beyond. Marley walks downstage center, talking directly to the audience. Pauses. The bell tolls, and I must take my leave. You must stay a while with Scrooge and watch him play out his Scroogey life. It is now the story, the once upon a time. Scrooge is busy in his counting house. Where else? Christmas Eve... And Scrooge is busy in his counting house. It is cold, bleak, biting weather outside, foggy withal. And if you listen closely, you can hear the people in the court go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The clocks outside strike three. Only three, and quite dark outside already. It has not been light all day this day. This ghostly bell rings in the distance again. Marley looks about him. Music in. Marley flies away. N.B. Marley's comings and goings should, from time to time, induce the explosion of the odd flashpot. I.H. 